It's tea time, positive tea time, and we are spilling all of it right here in this space created by two crazy fun-loving besties. It's a no-judgment zone for sharing stories of hope, faith, love, growth, and most of all, grace and gratitude. So join us as we get ready to share some positivity and get a fresh perspective on life. Hello and welcome to season four of Spilling Positivity. Can you believe we're actually here at season, season four? Season four, so excited. And we are sponsored by the lovely Litton's Tea. It has been a Caribbean tradition for over 150 years. So Natasha, now that we've introduced ourselves as season four, who do we have with us on the couch today? We have a doctor that is one of my favorite people. Can I just say that? So is he one of yours? Yes, he is. Absolutely. Do Dr. Vikash chat Rani OBGYN. He is a specialist in women's health and below the belt cancers. We are so excited to have you here. Thank you for having me. Both. Welcome. We are so happy to have you because our positivities, as we call them, yes. requested this episode. And thank you for being so quick to, um, to respond. He responded like, I was like, I just sent the message. I was like, he's like, sure. And that is him. That's how he is. Yes. Tell us about you. We know why we love you. And so by the end of this, you guys will love him too. But tell us a bit about you, your journey to medicine, why you even decided to become an OBGYN. So how far back you want me to go? <laughs> Born in Barbados, went to Queen's College, mm -hmm. went to pursue my postgraduate training in medicine at the University of the West Indies in Mona. Um, did my MBBS degree, came back to Barbados, worked at the Queen Elizabeth Hospital, went back to Jamaica, did my doctorate of medicine in obstetrics and gynecology, and then went further far to specialize in gynae oncology. So gynae oncology is basically the care of women with um, gynecological cancers. Uh. And that was at a high volume center in Mumbai, India. Mm -hmm. And then came back to Barbados in 2012 and was the catalyst for the formation of a gynae oncology unit at oh. the QEH, where we manage all the island's cancer care yeah. for women's cancer. Wow, that is... Belt. You have some Lipton tea to that. Yeah, let's sip a, tea for, a cup of tea for this one. Mm. Yes. Wow, you've done a lot. Very good. Um, you don't look like you're 80, but you seem to have done a lot. <laughs> <laughs> you're as young as you feel. Absolutely. I never ask the patient how old they are. I always mm -hmm. ask them how young they are. And mm -hmm. they always tell me their chronological age and what they feel like. So ah, okay. If they come in feeling old, trust me, when they, when they leave, they feel younger. Yes, 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 absolutely. Yes, yes. Always a great experience. And now you're here and you have been since 2012 working in this area. So Dr. Charan, you've done a lot. Uh, why OBGYN? Why this area? So I was a fan of the surgical discipline. Um, why I chose obstetrics and gynecology because it's a good balance. Mm -hmm. um, you have the gynecological surgery, mm -hmm. but then you also have the pregnant patient, your obstetric practice, and that to yeah. me is more of an art. Um, mm -hmm. Pregnancy is not an illness. Right. People come into you healthy. Right. We can have conversations with our clients, you know, and you make them feel good about their, their, mm -hmm. their progress through the, the pregnancy and yeah. their delivery, and then you bring life into this world. Being a fan of surgery too as well, then it allowed me to utilize those skills and offer them for good in terms of the more complex surgeries, which would be the cancer surgeries. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. One of the things about you is that your bedside manner, you're so engaging with your patients. And as one of your patients, I can say, you can ask you anything, um, which is really important, I think. Mm -hmm. um, and you, you're very clear and you explain everything and makes everyone well, feel comfortable. I grew up with three sisters. Right. Yeah. So I have two elder sisters, one younger one, and kind of gives you a little insight into the psyche of women yeah. in terms of they don't want to be treated as a patient. Right. Yeah. They want to be treated as a friend. But you just yeah. call them clients, which was for mm. me, somebody working in customer and client relationships. I love that because you see them as someone that you're servicing. Yes. Yeah. Well, yeah. not literally, but. Not. <laughs> <laughs> right. but no, you see, it's not just, health is not just the absence of disease. Mm -hmm. It's physical, mental, all that well-being put mm -hmm. together yeah. that makes somebody feel healthy. That's right. true. Your emotional well-being is, is an important part of yeah. feeling good. Yeah, yeah, it's so true. And your emotional intelligence is off the chart. Uh -huh. So now let's get down to the nitty-gritty. Let's get down and to the nitty-gritty. And talk nitty -gritty. about yeah. women's health. Um, you know, a lot of women have issues. Some women go through life but don't have anything. Uh -huh. Don't have to deal with anything. You go, to, you know, they may have 
you know, go through puberty and have issues, but there are issues out there. What are some of the things that you see um, and that you would like to, women to know about in terms of women's health? Prevention is better than cure. Mm -hmm. So I think that's one of the main important things when it comes to women's health. There are a lot of things there that we can find early and prevent from happening, mm -hmm. um, spe specifically the cancers, but then also um, the metabolic syndromes too as well. So I'm using big words, I don't like to use that, mm -hmm. but I know one of the topics you guys wanted me to talk about today was polycystic ovarian syndrome. Yeah. PCOS. PCOS. Yes. And just the name itself lends itself to believe that it's an issue of the ovary, right? Mm -hmm. Polycystic ovarian syndrome. Mm -hmm. But you don't have to have polycystic ovaries to have the syndrome. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, so it's a condition where um, you either have to have two or three things. One, irregular periods or absent periods. Con and and that, that causes an ovulation where you don't release eggs on a monthly basis. Mm -hmm. That's one of the criteria. Two, hyperandrogenism. Big word again but just means that you have excess testosterone in the body. Mm. Yeah. And that may manifest in different ways where you have um, hair growth in places that women right. don't have hair growth. And then obviously the, the name where it comes from is in terms of the ultrasound findings. Where on ultrasound you see multiple follicles or mm -hmm. cysts on mm -hmm. the ovary. And these are follicles that haven't been released as yet. Yeah. So mm -hmm. once you have two of those three things, you mm -hmm. are termed as having polycystic ovarian syndrome. Yeah. It's a common disorder. I mean, a third of women have polycystic ovarian syndrome. Yeah. And you can have polycystic ovaries without having the syndrome, mm -hmm. if that makes any sense. In terms of you can do an ultrasound, have no symptoms, don't have irregular periods, right. irregular periods, and don't have the syndrome where you are not ovulating every month. Right. So what are some of the treatments? Because I myself, um, was I, what do I consider it now anyway? I had PCOS, so to speak. Um, and thanks to you and your guidance and support, I'm thankful to say that I have passed through that and moved on to the other side. And passed through with flying with colors. Flying colors, according to, <laughs> according to my doctor. But what can women do to, I know for me it was stopping using, slowing down on sugars, increasing exercise, watching my diet. Okay, so tell me exactly, let's for the camera's sake, mm -hmm. what exactly were the challenges you were having when you were diagnosed with polycystic ovarian syndrome? I had the, I also, I had the irregular periods for right. sure, or, and then sometimes excessive, excessively long periods. Mm -hmm. um, I didn't have the hair growing in certain spaces, except for maybe a few strands. things on my strands on my chin, but it was definitely the irregular periods as well as excessive flows sometimes. Right. So. Yeah. I, I always tell my patients the uterus or the womb has two functions in life. Mm -hmm. One is to cry every month when you don't get pregnant, which is your menstrual effluent. Mm -hmm. And the other one is to call baby for nine months and yeah. transform from a storage organ to more of an expulsive organ where it pushes baby through the birth canal. Right. Mm -hmm. So the process of having periods every month is a result of you not conceiving. Right. So it means that you've had to have ovulated, mm -hmm. you didn't fertilize that egg and then basically the uterus resets every month. Right. So if you're not ovulating every month, what's happening is that lining or that cushion of the uterus builds up. Yes. And then when you do have a period, it can be heavy yeah. because you're not releasing it on a monthly basis, so it just accumulates over time. Mm -hmm. So you have women who have no periods at all, mm -hmm. women who have irregular periods, women when they have periods, they're so heavy that it's debilitating and you have to find some sort of treatment for that. It lasts a long time as well? It could be longer, yeah. So when we say heavy periods, it could mean either the flow is a lot yeah. or the duration, duration is a lot. Duration, yeah. What's the longest? Yeah, What's yeah. a long... Some people don't stop bleeding. Yeah. yeah. Wow. They can get spotting every day, bleeding every day, and it, and it gets really, really bad that you then have to wow. provide pharmacological interventions to try to control that. Wow. Yeah, I know for me, it was, sometimes it would last for like three weeks and it would be heavy excessively heavy, like I couldn't go to the office, I couldn't go to where I had to work from home. And imagine yeah. how, how that would impact that was, your life. It did, yeah. it, it did impact my life, especially yeah. in my late 30s, early 40s, yeah, for sure. Right. So when we look at polycystic ovarian syndrome, we, we have to consider it as a metabolic disorder. Mm -hmm. What's happening is that um, when, you, when you have polycystic ovaries, it's a result of imbalances in your hormones. Mm -hmm. Because of these imbalances, you, you want to basically try to control the underlying problem and that's why we, a lot of our patients are overweight when they have polycystic yes. ovarian syndrome. Mm -hmm. But a lot of them are normal weight too as well. Really? Yes, so you can actually have irregular periods mm -hmm. with polycystic ovaries without being overweight. And I thought you had to be overweight. No, ma okay. majority are. But mm -hmm. You actually do have some normal size, skinny size women coming in. Mm -hmm. Imbalances in their hormones mm -hmm. secondary to polycystic ovarian syndrome. Okay. So those who are overweight, it's easy to say, you know, controlling it, the treatment would be you know, dieting, losing weight, exercising. 
but it's really the sugar consumption that uh -huh. causes it. Because you see, we've been brought up in a country where we're, we're a sugar developing nation. You know, we always say, I feel a little bit low, mm -hmm. I need a little tough up, I need a little I sugar. Little sugar, oh, yes. Sugar. But sugar, unfortunately, yes, it's a good source of calories, but mm -hmm. it's now being over consumed. Right. And if you read this, watch this documentary on YouTube called Sugar, the Bitter Truth, you have to realize how we became dependent on sugar. It right. goes back to World War II. Wow. When we were struggling to ship sugar out, these developing nations didn't mm -hmm. have access to, to, to resources. What they did is that they invested in alternatives to sugar. And they looked at, high, they looked at beet sugar, it was hard to mm -hmm. develop. Then they looked at high fructose corn syrup. Right. Mm -hmm. And then when you, when you see a lot of the things that we consume nowadays yes. has in high fructose yes. corn syrup. Mm -hmm. so, so we're consuming sugar on a, a regular basis. Our levels are high such that the point that when they come down to normal, we feel low. Yeah. And then okay. we have to consume back again to get that rush. Mm -hmm. A lot of these sweets. Mm -hmm. Sugar is a new drug. Yeah, yeah before, I agree Before, that. 40, 50 years ago, you used to get cigarette packages at the checkout counter. Yeah. What at the checkout counter now at supermarkets? Chocolate. Yeah. Chocolates, Chocolates and candy. candy. Yeah. So that's a new drug. And yeah. then you become so addicted to it that you feel you have to keep eating something sweet to keep your sugar up. Wow. Right. And then what happens is you become dependent on it. And yeah. then sugar is a high caloric intake. Yes. So your yeah. body then stores it at fat, as mm -hmm. fat. So you really want foods that are complex, like the complex carbohydrates. Mm -hmm. Things that would take your body time to break down. Mm -hmm. right. The ground provisions right. and yeah. those sort of things. And that's why we try to encourage people mm -hmm. to avoid diabetes by eating too much sugar. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. Now, we just talked about PCOS, but let's talk a bit about PCOS and perimenopause. PCOS is more a reproductive problem because right. you're not ovulating every month. Mm -hmm. Perimenopause is when you're coming to the end of your reproductive career, where your ovaries are not releasing eggs on a regular basis, you're not producing the hormones, and you may start to miss periods. Right. And they, mm -hmm. they start to stutter, for, for lack of a better word. Mm. And that is the transition now between being reproductive and fertile mm -hmm. into not when you put men on pause, <laughs> but when, when your estrogen levels start to right. decline. Mm -hmm. right. And that in itself brings its own challenges. Right, because what a lot of people don't know is that estrogen actually impacts your brain, how you think, how you feel. It's like yeah. it controls your thermostat, which is the hypothalamus mm -hmm. in your brain, yeah. which actually impacts how you think, how you feel, if your body's hot or cold. I mean, and estrogen actually keeps your skin looking young. Yeah, yeah. It keeps your boobs from sagging. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's estrogen so many Estrogen is the things. difference between a man and a woman. It makes them, I mean, without estrogen, you all won't be the lovely, miserable creatures <laughs> you are. I mean. Yeah, <laughs> point taken. But then what role does testosterone play in that whole mechanic? Right, whole so mechanic. testosterone is the male hormone. Right. Everybody has testosterone, males and females. Males mm -hmm. have it in more abundance. But testosterone is required for libido. Right. right for mm -hmm. that for that ability mm -hmm. to have that desire mm -hmm. and that can also be affected with um perimenopause, perimenopause as well as polycystic so ovaries. therefore it would affect the polycystic ovaries as you go to yes yeah, so actually so what happens is that the balance between estrogen and testosterone is is not there in polycystic ovarian syndrome mm -hmm. you oh. actually have more testosterone, testosterone. Mm -hmm. so what happens is that that's what you get the hair growth it's a right. hyper androgen or hyper testosterone state mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that's why you have to try to re 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 try to get back balance between these two and reverse that imbalance. So Perry does that for you? So Perry now, because your estrogen levels start to decline, you may have initially high ah. levels of testosterone compared uh -huh. to estrogen. Uh -huh. But then when you fully go through menopause, both of them decline. Oh. So you find then women complaining of decreased libido, having gone through menopause, and that's where they need sometimes supplementation yeah, to yeah. keep mm -hmm. them going. But she, she made a valid point that, mm -hmm. that, that, you know, estrogen is important for a lot of specific functions yes. in your body. Yeah. Not only keeping your, your skin soft and your hair flowing, mm -hmm. but it also has protective effects on your heart and bones. Okay. So when you go through menopause, we've actually shown that, you know, your risk of heart disease now becomes that equivalent to that of a man. Mm -hmm. Really? So your risk of heart disease is less right. when, mm -hmm. you're, when, you're, when you have estrogen levels. Your risk of osteoporosis now increases after menopause, mm -hmm. your risk of fractures. So that's why there's a role for hormone replacement therapy mm -hmm. in a select few, um, but not even a select few, in a, in a good set to help get you transition through that period of, okay. of, of perimenopause and menopause and maintaining your bone health and your heart health and your, your skin and your hair, your lubrication, because right. it's, it's responsible for all for of those all things. Of those all things. Of, yeah, yeah and, it's and, critical. Yeah, and, and I think long time ago, menopause used to be looked at, oh, well, 
she's just going through, through the, change. the change. And you know, and you know, she's a little, maybe a little body or a little emotional, but it's actually a physiological Correct. issue. It, I call it reverse puberty. Yeah. During puberty, the hormones rush in, during um, <laughs> perimenopause, they're rushing they're out. Yeah. Rushing out. Yeah, so yeah. I think a lot of women don't understand at that stage what is going on with their body. Definitely, it used to be a taboo back then. Yes. And, yes. I, and I think what's happening now where people are embracing hormone health, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, we prescribe it. There was a lot of negativity, I think, back in the 90s about hormone replacement yes. therapy. But we're seeing those things being debunked now. Because it was based on a very small correct. subset. Yes, yeah. correct. So mm -hmm. what they did is they basically gave hormones to all women who were either perimenopause or women who were menopausal for 10, 15 years. Right. Mm -hmm. And what they found from the results is that it may, it may have had the deleterious effects in those who had completed menopause over five or 10 years ago, uh. because you were now introducing back something that your body wasn't accustomed to. Right. Mm -hmm. But if you actually narrow in on the women who are going through menopause, you can see the benefits and they don't have those effects. Absolutely. Yeah. Ooh, some good tea was spilled today. Tune in next week for part two.